Hello, I'm Donovan Bigelow, and this is the first part of a multi-part lecture on infant development. I believe that these are the most important lectures I've ever given, and they seem to be gelling around four or five or six different psychological theories. The most interesting thing in the last 20 years in the field of psychology has been the explosion of the neurosciences and, and neurology and the expansion of technologies designed to scan the human brain, including the brain of infants. And what we have now is developmental neuroscience, psychoanalytic work, infant observation, developmental psychology, and the derivatives of John Bowlby's attach attachment theory. All of these different, di once disparate fields, seem to be congealing around infant development. They still use different language, obviously, but if you read the data, the literature carefully, what you find repeatedly is they're all pointing in the same direction. This has absolutely profound implications for how we teach psychology, for how we experience development, and most importantly, and this may be the most important part, how we think about raising babies, how we think about pregnancy, mothering, fathering. One of the great revolutions uh, in psychology is not just the neurological research, but very quickly the derivatives of that that have paralleled medical science. In medical science, doctors regularly tell patients what to do and what not to do to avoid disease. Most people obey their doctors because they see that avoiding the disease, prevention, is absolutely essential. No one disregards a doctor's prescriptions on how to do things or how not to do things. At least they don't do it cavalierly. They do it knowing what they're doing. They, know, they do it knowing that they're in trouble if they keep doing it. So it's common, it's absolutely normal. No one raises an eyebrow when a medical doctor tells someone to do or not to do something to avoid to prevent disease. That is the second revolution in psychology. We are now at a place where it is no longer, and, and this is troubling, it's difficult, it's a, it's a painful change for therapists, I think. We're no longer in a position to simply wait for patients to come into our office or to have the patients that we have and simply work with the derivatives, the sequelae, of mental illness. If parents come into our offices, if young people in their 20s and 30s come into our, our offices and they are thinking about having children, we have some obligation, it seems to me, to use the latest derivatives of science to inform them prescriptively of what developmental sciences have allowed us to conclude about what is good for children. What do children need really? How are parents supposed to behave? What are they supposed to do? And this is the most important part. Who are they supposed to be? This cannot be done in terms of a behavioral checklist. The third great revolution is that parental being who the mother is, is dramatically more important than what she does mechanically, behaviorally, in the day-to-day -day external care of the baby. The, the sort of extend, I'll call this an extended revolution. There's so many elements to it. But what we are discovering, what all the different fields of psychology appear to be discovering almost simultaneously, is the profound importance of an internal perspective, the psychic reality of the mother. If that is healthy, if it is whole, if it is integrated, then that is what she primarily provides to the growing, nascent experience in the child. The child's mind takes that in, the growing child's mind takes that in, and not just the mind. Here's the other part that's dramatic. The brain and the mind grow together and there is no longer any possible way to think about brain and mind, nature and nurture, genetics and environment as in any meaningfully meaningful way separated. It turns out the neuroscientists have now confirmed to 
a scientific truth, validity, that love makes your brain grow, that enriched environments, which means primarily a healthy, whole, integrated mother's mind, pre present to the child in an adequate way, actually evokes brain growth. It's called epigenetics. The experience-determined brain growth means that there is an inextricable weaving between the environment, the mother, the father, the experience the child has emotionally of being parented, and the literal, physical, neurological structures of the brain. Um, it's hard to imagine a greater revolution in the field of infant development than that. This is what allows us to make prescriptions about what a mother and father need to do and how they need to experience their own childhoods, how that needs to be worked through, resolved, how the derailments of their own development must be evaluated, looked at, talked about, worked through to some adequate degree prior to them becoming parents. If they've already become parents, then we have to do some makeup work fairly quickly. We have to help therapists, have to help new parents, or parents who've been parents for some time, realize that the dynamics they've had with their children that may have caused problems, we have to be honest about that, can even at a significantly late date still be intervened concerning and dealt with and transformed and made better. There's a, a phrase I read recently called earned attachment. A mother who herself is very disturbed and whose child is becoming disturbed because the child is taking in a very disturbed mother. They both can be helped. They both can be assisted in restructuring a derailed developmental dynamic. The child has to have the mother get herself right first before it can be better. A clinician cannot intervene with the baby if the mother's mind doesn't provide a strong containing object for the baby. The good news, it appears, is that it's almost never too late. There may be critical periods. That's a phrase in developmental psychology that, that retains some weight. It's a, important to get things done in the right order. That's true. And in addition to that now we see it's never too late to make significant improvement. So in a way, um, on the one hand, we see now more and more the absolute centrality of the earliest phases of infant development. We also see, which, which puts a great deal of pressure, frankly, on young parents, who being young parents are probably least able to get the necessary jobs done alone. And the hopefulness of extended adult development that will allow adaptively almost anyone at any age to move back into a healthy developmental process, including, it seems, increasing brain volume and neurological sophistication and interconnectivity, even at substantially later dates than we thought previously were, were possible. So, the other thing neurological science has shown is that there seems to be rather a dramatic split between the left brain and the right brain. The left brain, frontal cortex, concerns and is processing language, consciousness, um, verbal communication, reason, logic, but the right brain is much more primitive, primitive in that it is unconscious processing of emotional affective attunement, emotional regulation of either hypo or hyper affective states, all of it subverbal, all of it before, under, unconscious, beneath awareness, all of it done almost instantaneously. So what's happening is that we're starting to understand that even in therapy, the key communication is not verbal, it is emotional, right brain to right brain. If the mother's right brain is sufficiently developed, we see with her 
interacting with a baby, this emotional connectivity that the baby is taking in. It isn't what the mother says, and it's not so much what she does. It's who she is at a much more fundamental level than perhaps we appreciated before. It gives, uh, it calls into pretty radical question the approaches from the 40s and 50s and 60s that describe parenting as a checklist of behaviors, of things to do, of schedules to get the baby on, of when the baby was supposed to sit up and when the baby was supposed to stand up and when potty training was done. Those things cl clearly have some importance, but they pale to insignificance, now we see, relative to the primacy of the mother's mind. The details of how that connectivity happens, the impact it has, and the specifics of what a baby needs are, uh, will take up the bulk of all of these lectures. Um, to be a little more specific, the, it's divided into three parts. The first part I describe as containment and reverie, the qualities of mothering and fathering. And I'm going to cover these developmental needs of the infant. How is a mind, how is a self formed? I will cover the latest neurobiology, genetics of the developing mind. We'll address again from another perspective the qualities of mothering and what's called the provision of primary experience. I will touch on, because this is one of the latest developing areas, the prenatal experience and postnatal development. Uh, brief preview, uh, we have backed up the importance of the earliest uh, perinatal phase of development, well, there's a great deal of very recent research just in the last 10 years that suggests the prenatal experience may even be as important as the postnatal experience. We have underestimated the power of fetal development and its subsequent impact on the life trajectory of all of us. We're going to address some of that. Uh, I will in more detail describe and try to give an experiential uh, understanding of containment and reverie, these two central ideas. I will address briefly sexual development beginning in infancy, if not before. I did have uh, several hours of lectures on sexuality uh, already on the website, but it seems to me that this is such an important deal, I need to review some of the earlier aspects of that here. And I will touch on the role of fathers in this whole process. I think that has to be done, though just preliminarily. That's part one, the basics of child development, infant development. Uh, part two will be uh, maternal and paternal deprivation and the autistic spectrum. What happens and how does that development uh, in section one get derailed? We'll talk about the neurobiology of deprivation. I will begin with a very brief summary that's, I think, very honest from the Center of D for Disease Control and the National Infor uh, Institute of Mental Health. Um, they're very clear about uh, their lack of clear understanding as to the causes of uh, autistic spectrum disorders. There's some good data beyond them that suggests um, pretty directly the cause of those things, and we will get to them. Um, no discussion of autistic spectrum disorders will be remotely complete without discussing the work of Francis Tustin. It's probably true, I, I think I'm, I might even go so far as to say indisputably true, that no one um, ever has worked more diligently, directly, thoroughly, for longer or with more autistic children than Francis Tustin, her dozen, half a dozen, dozen odd books um, on the, the subject document her evolution as a clinician for these children over the course of her over 30 decades of work and I think she remains the go-to source for um, most of the be best clinical insights on the subject. I will also too briefly discuss the impact of adoption, single parenting, divorce, premature birth and medical issues in infants daycare, and alternative family forms. Each one of those subjects deserves an entirely separate lecture, but there's just not time for everything, so I will touch on them and hopefully at least begin a dialogue about that. Finally, section three will be about assessment, prevention, and treatment. 
again, focusing on this new way of thinking about prevention as a completely legitimate element of psychotherapy uh, and how to approach that carefully. Um, I think this area, at least as much, if not more, than the sexuality, certainly more than the child development lectures I gave, is we're all in danger of misunderstanding things. And that's because everything about these lectures evoke in us our most primitive experience. These lectures will scare you. They will make you angry. They will make you frustrated. And that is essential to contain and to think about the material. If you're getting angry, if you're getting frustrated, if you're feeling like it all has to stop and I have to be censored, <laughs> please pay attention to that. Um, the advice is, listen to yourself listening to me. Uh, the great analyst uh, James Grotstein um, used that phrase in a discussion, uh, in several discussions in his books uh, and also in some um, seminars he gave. He was describing an experience he had with his analyst Wilfred Bion, and we'll get to Bion's material a little bit later. He asked Bion a question. Uh, and, tr and, and asked him a question laying out what he thought Bion had said. And Bion said, okay, stop. Don't listen to me. Listen to you listening to me. And Grotstein told uh, a group of us that, and I've read it in his text. And to me it was a profound moment because it was what happened. He, with that phrase, this is the importance of it, he made the shift from left brain to right brain. He made the shift from learning. He made the shift from theory to an emotional, evocative, unconscious, affect-regulating experience. Not an intellectual theory, but something going on inside you. Something evoked in you has to be attended to. An emotion has to be felt, experienced contained, held in mind, and then thought about long enough to make some deeper meaning out of that experience. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what thinking is. That and very little else. If you're not doing that, you're not really thinking. If you're not doing that, what you're doing is reacting to anxiety, fear, frustration, anger, in a rote, memorized, reactive, intellectual, defensive way that has nothing to do with creative thought. Openness to experience, awareness of self in the context of relations with others. Thinking in this way, the fourth or fifth aspect of this revolution in thinking about, about infant development, is it changes the nature of what we mean by thinking. Thinking has to be informed by the, by the presence of an emotional valence, a sense of self, an identity, grounded in the intersubjective, grounded in the relational dynamic taken in from the mother by the baby, which forms the fundamental substrate of everyone's identity, of the self. That is how the self is formed introjection, identification with a healthy, present mother's brain, mind, and the internalization of the mother's skill at thinking in the way I've just described. If the mother can do that, the baby can take that in and him or herself will be able slowly over time. This takes a long time. A long time. But they will be able, if that happens in the baby's presence with the mother that can do that herself, then that internalized skill set, that internalized not just skill set, that internalized experience of self as a thinking being informed by the bedrock of feeling states and affect regulation, that's how the self evolves. That how the, is how the self becomes. That is how bec you become who you are. Wow. All right. My sense is, and I'll say this again because it's important, that we have a problem with theories, left brain, intellectual theories. What I'm trying to do, and what I'm trying desperately to do almost, is to synthesize out 
the mere intellectual and stay grounded in reality and stay grounded as much as possible in science. What I've tried to do is pull from the four or five or six most important fields. Again, psychoanalytic, the psychoanalytic work of Freud, Melanie Klein, and Wilfred Bion, that trajectory, and the post bionian thinking, modern derivatives of John Bowlby's attachment theory, all of the amazing neurological research, the separate field of infant observation, and the separate field of developmental psychology, all of these. Uh, I think I can fairly say now that these different perspectives, all heading in the same direction, form the bedrock of what we may fairly now call the science of infant development. I am trying hard to stay in science and reality. I, I believe, at least tentatively, that what I'm presenting here now and in the next several hours is not an ideology, is not just a theory, isn't speculation. I have my feet, my theoretical feet, grounded in decades of scientific research, observation, and clinical experience. Is it the final word? Of course not. This is an organic thing, and it will grow and change. And if I give this same lecture in 10 years, I can't even imagine that it isn't going to be radically different. So the differences th that I am describing now with what has come before your experience of, of this material is an opportunity for you to be aware of what's evoked inside you. I will try my best to stay grounded in reality and science, and that is my request of any listener, to stay grounded in your own experience, grounded in your thoughtful and emotionally attuned experience of yourself and this material. Listen to yourself listening to me. And you are not required to agree with anything. But if there is conflict, and this is something that um, Mary, Marian Milner described in one of her texts that I think is absolutely central, that we have to see conflict as essential to development, that there is no development, there is no movement, there is no overcoming without some tension, without some conflict, without disagreement. The difference here, and it is an all-important uh, all important difference, is that difference does not mean invalidation. Difference need not be experienced as an insult. We have to be able to tolerate that difference and that conflict and not try to attack or suppress that which differs from us. We ought to be strong enough, capable enough, to take that experience of conflict in. Sit with it. Think about it. Let it evoke in us what it does in our um, own emotional experience, right brain stuff, and think about it and respond in a thoughtful way. If you are experiencing this, this material and you feel the need to attack, then please let that be something you sit with for a while and think about. Let me jump right into this to several ideas that I think have to be understood in order for this material to be meaningful to you, in order for you to be able to contain and hold on to and think about it. Um, I, I, I used this in a previous lecture, I believe. It's the concept of negative capability. That phrase was used by the great English romantic poet John Keats in the early 19th century. He wrote a letter to his brother, I believe, and was describing Shakespeare and other great people, and he described great men and women who had this attribute, negative capability, the ability to not react, and I th the ability to sit with not knowing and allow that to be fruitful, allow that to be generative. That is exactly what I'm talking about here. Um, the ability to sit with not knowing. Now, for most of us, that's very unsettling. It evokes anxiety. We want to know things. The old saying, it's the devil you don't know that gets you. To not know is experienced as dangerous. And so I think that's why people prematurely come up with an excuse, a reason, a rationalization. Because they'd rather have an answer that's wrong than no answer at all. And I'm pleading with, with listeners of this to do your best to sit in that, to find that capability, that negative capability, and not react. 
and hold on to whatever you're experiencing with this material and sit with it for a while and let it make sense. All right, uh, fifth or sixth revolution. The shift from external reality to psychic reality, central to understanding this material at all, is the necessary addition of the realm of psychic reality. Everybody understands mostly external reality, the things you do, how you interact with others, what you have to do, what you have to do today, your checklists of things you got to get done, how you walk across the street, how you talk to people, all those, all the developmental, infant development things that most people have been talking about for the last several decades. When do you feed a child? What kind of formula is best? Is breastfeeding better than formula? When should this child sit up? When should the child be, be sleeping in its own crib away from the mother's bedroom? All of those external developmental milestones that people have been struggling with literally for decades. I'm not saying they're not important. Of course they're important. But what seems now to be a necessary prerequisite for those to happen at all is the shift from external reality to the psychic reality of the mother first and then the link between the mother's psychic reality and the growing nascent psychic reality of the baby. That's where most of this um, developmental research uh, is taking place. This is where virtually all of the neurological science um, where all of that is going. And I think if you can't hold open that idea, then most of these lectures are going to be, at the very least, confusing. I will be speaking mostly about the baby's psychic reality and about the mother and father's psychic reality. To access that, to be open to the experience of that, is, is what this is all about. And I think one of the things that all the theories agree on now is that without that shift in focus from external to internal, the external never gets done. There's developmental derailment that makes the schedule of external development impossible to meet. That without the internal psychic reality focus, we never get to things. It gets derailed. The internal focus is the necessary prerequisite, now seen, to all of the developmental milestones. In all mental illness, it looks like, we find, if we go back carefully enough, some infant-level developmental derailment. The, even the neurological sciences seem to be as clear about that as anybody these days. Freud always thought and in 1905, when he laid this out, caused quite a storm that most adult neuroses, he thought, had their etiology, their cause, in childhood developmental derailment. We now see that he was right about that. There is very little conflicting evidence. If you're an adult and you're depressed, you did not catch depression like you might have caught the flu last winter that depression is an event in adulthood or adolescence that is a latent, unconscious mm -hmm. dynamic laid down in infancy that gets evoked by experiences in adolescence and adulthood, but is not caused by those experiences at all. Even adult trauma takes place in the context of already experienced developmental dynamics. So that two people experiencing the tr same trauma are going to have radically different reactions to it. Everyone knows that's true, but this is why. Because the infant developmental dynamics lay the bedrock on which all subsequent experience happens and determine to a large degree the quality of that experience one way or the other. All right, and the next part is not just a theoretical problem. Um, it's also a problem that we have to acknowledge in this area because it's a problem of language. I am sitting here talking to you. I am talking using primarily my left brain. 
my language capability, my reason, my conscious awareness of this experience. But I am talking about something in my right brain that is pre-linguistic, pr unconscious, affect regulation related, and in some ways dramatically cut off, separate from the way I am describing it now. That sets up that sets up very difficult theoretical problems. How do you use language to talk about something that happened before language was available? It's always going to therefore be a bit of a translation. And that means I don't get to lay down some absolute truth because even if I knew it, <laughs> I couldn't, I don't have any language sufficient to describe something that is a experience beyond language. So it's a humbling thing. And so I want to be very clear, though I am pitching this stuff as science, I am pitching this stuff as the best integration of the best research across the board in five different psychology domains. And I think that's true. I simultaneously acknowledge that I have to be a little bit humble about claiming any, any sort of abstract truth or abject truth. Um, and I'm assuming that though this may be the best we have now, it's going to be subject to subsequent research and it's going to get better. But I will say that this, this, this is a game changer. This is a paradigm shift. This is a very profound paradigm shift, even with the problem of language. Okay. Um, I have to, again, I think I also did this in the child development stuff. There's going to be a fair number of, of moments in these lectures where I drop my eyes to a page and read. I'm going to be quoting, and I apologize in advance. I know as a teacher that from the perspective of pedagogy, of the t theory of teaching, that's an inefficient and distracting way to present information. I'm sorry, I have no better way to do it. This material is so important and that I have to get it right. And the thinkers who I'm going to be quoting, I will, I will give you their names and the texts out of which I'm quoting, are so profound and so central to this paradigm shift that I have to get them right and I, I simply I can't do better than their language. So please, don't be put off by the reading. At when I, matter of fact, that's the point in time when you should be paying the most and closest attention, where you might re reverse the, the video and watch it again, listen to it again. Take in the quotes as, as perhaps the most profound and important part of the entire lecture. Um, that's my best excuse for quoting too much. Um, let me start with Freud. Uh, Freud, as I think I've said before, takes a bit of a hit um, these days, but that seems unwarranted. Uh, most people mistakenly think of Freud these days as some sort of advocate of the patriarchy, of, of male dominance. Well, at the end of his life, 1938, he wrote, and I quote, a child's first erotic object is the mother's breast that nourishes it. Love has its origin in attachment to the satisfied need for nourishment. There is no doubt that to begin with, the child does not distinguish between the breast and its own body. When the breast has to be separated from the body and shifted to the outside, because the child so often finds it absent, it carries with it as an object a part of the original narcissistic libidinal cathexis. Okay, never mind that. That's Freud's old language. <coughs> the child takes in the mother's breast as an internalized object. This first object is later completed into the person of the child's mother who not only nourishes it but also looks after it and thus arouses in it a number of other physical sensations, pleasurable and unpleasurable. By her care of the child's body, she becomes its first seducer. In, this is the important part. In these two relations lie the root of a mother's importance, unique, without parallel, established unalterably for a whole lifetime as the first and strongest love object and as the prototype for all later love objects for both sexes. Even with the latest researches in all the fields of psychology, no one has summarized better the importance of a mother than Freud did in 1938. 
the entire thrust of the, of the modern researchers has been to show the profound importance of the mother. Um, I, think it's, I think it's not an accident that Freud's genius came up with this at the end of his life after 40 plus years of clinical experience. Um, speaking of language, I think it's important that I clarify some of the what might be slightly technical terms. If you listen to the previous lectures on Freud and child development, uh, perhaps these will make sense and I can go over them quickly. Um, the first is introjection and identification. What actually does the baby do with the mother? Well, we know the baby isn't listening to what the mother says. The content of her language it turns out that it almost doesn't matter what the mother says in terms of content of language. What matters is the prosodic tonality, the emotionality, the rhythm of the speech, the affective valence of the speech and its order. That is what's being communicated to the baby. Okay, that's, what being com what, that's what's being communicated. How does the baby take it in? Remember, not left brain language, but right brain affect emotional resonance. The psychoanalysts use the word introjection or identification. The baby takes in the mother's experience of it. The mother's smile, the mother's melody of her voice is taken in by the baby. Now, when that's good, it's all quite lovely for the baby. But no mother is good all the time. Mothers are human. They don't have to be perfect. They have to be good enough. More on that later. But what happens when either the mother is angry, frustrated, resentful, distracted, envious? What happens when the baby has a stomach ache, diaper rash, is hungry, feels neglected, abandoned? They do this all the time. Well, the baby's mental mechanism for managing these feeling states, which to the baby alone are intolerable, is called splitting and projection. The baby will split off the good from the bad and project it out psychically in a very rudimentary way, getting rid of it. Now, this sounds very technical, very complex, very theoretical, very abstract, but it isn't. Everybody understands splitting. We do it all the time. It may, be, it may be a dominant form of infantile management of anxiety, but people do it all the time. That's what, why we have political parties. <laughs> that's why we have co comic books and cartoons. There's a good, that's why we have movies like Star Wars. There's the force and the dark side. This is splitting, all good on one side, all bad on the other. It's basically a psychic equivalent of a Western. Okay. And it's a way we as adults sometimes manage anxiety that we don't like or can't contain within us. We pretend that all the bad is over there, that we're good. This is where I suggest, not very respectfully actually, that most political activists are quite mentally ill. They have taken an infantile emotional dynamic designed to help a baby manage unmanageable emotional experiences and use them when they should be thinking to manage their own unmanageable emotions, revealing their mental illness and seeing the world dichotomously in all good and all bad terms. We're the good guys, you're the bad guys. We hate X, whatever it X is. We're righteous in the cause, we're the true believers. And you can go down this road too far, but it seems to me quite common these days. And you see this every time you turn on the news. People aren't talking about things in a thoughtful way. They're yelling at each other. That's a sign of splitting. I have all the right, you have all the bad, and I don't like you and I get to do bad things to you because you, you are so bad. That's what a baby is doing because that's all they can do. It's a perfectly reasonable thing for a baby to do. For an adult, not so much. Where does the baby's bad feelings, objects, go when they split them off and project them? Well, they go into the mother. 
What does the mother do with them? The mother contains them. If her mind can contain her own anxiety, is strong enough, whole enough, healthy enough to do that, she can contain the baby's anxiety and process it and give it back in a way that the baby can tolerate. She projects love and care, having handled anxiety, fear, rage, abandonment, feelings, all kinds of terrible things that the babies have, and gives it back to the baby in a way that facilitates the growth of the baby's mind. Is the mother in the baby? Not initially. Only pieces and parts, because the baby initially is lost in a kind of symbiotic oneness with the mother. When that happens, the baby can't really tell itself from its mother. That's the, that's the genius of Freud when he described that the baby not really being able to tell inside from outside, not being able to distinguish the breast from itself, that happens slowly over the course of the first six months we've discovered. That it's not until the baby has internalized enough of that love and formed a solid emotional containment within itself, having taken that in, identified with the mother's ability to do that, that the baby can see the mother as whole, and therefore no need from the baby's perspective to split into all good and all bad. Ah, mother is one, and I am separate. We are no longer together, but I am also me. I am whole. Mother is whole. She's both the one that loves me and cares for me, and she's also the one that makes me mad sometimes. And I am good, and I am also suffering, and I need help but I'm also now independent. And that's going to be the subject in a little bit of the separation individuation material I've covered in the other lecture, but from a much earlier infantile perspective. That variation between oneness and separateness and how that, how that develops and how it always re retains a developmental legacy within us. One of the profound things this material has provided me is an awareness that the primitive, uh, this phrase you can take to the bank, the primitive is never transcended. Melanie Klein initially said that, I believe. The primitive is never transcended. We retain in us a legacy of everything that has happened to us going back to the in utero time, prenatally. We, our identities, our sense of self, is the, is the result of a long-term, slowly accumulating process. We do not develop in a linear way. We develop more like a snowball accumulating all these experiences, and they all remain with us in a profoundly present way. I used this example before, I think. Freud initially thought that mental illness was a regression to a previous early developmental state. I don't know anybody that thinks that way these days. We now see that you don't have to go very far to get crazy because you brought crazy with you. <laughs> and on a bad day, we can all get a little crazy. And I think this way of thinking explains why and how that happens. Most of you at some point in time have lost your temper, fallen into a rage, felt yourself fall apart, and then you get yourself back together? Well, those metaphors are profoundly literal in the sense of how the mind initially fragmented, initially dominated by splitting and projection and introjection of maternal processes, and then whole, integrated, capable of seeing yourself and others in a whole object relationship which means you can accept that people aren't perfect, don't need to idealize them. They have some good and bad qualities that makes them human. Oh, and so do I, and therefore there's tolerance, there's acceptance, there's some, there's some strength in that that's quite profound. And of course, then, and only then, the ability to think, to really think, and not just repeat. So that idea, the primitive is never transcended, remains sort of bedrock wisdom here. Um, 
a couple of more details. Klein talked about persecutory anxiety. And I think what she meant by that, and it's kind of an abstract idea, that a baby experiences frustration and pain. And if anybody, <laughs> if you've ever watched a baby for more than 10 minutes, you can see they go through rather dramatic swings of emotional stability to instability, that they can be happy one moment and in a screaming red-faced rage, seemingly at the flip of a switch. Well, what happens? inside their mind. What's going on in there? How does that happen? What does it mean to them? How, therefore, could we, if we knew that, we might be able to do something about it more effectively and more efficiently? Well, Klein talked about the experience of the baby as being persecuted by bad objects. The baby's rudimentary mind, and we are right in the middle of that problem with language now, in the baby's rudimentary mind, there are objects that are bad and objects that are good. It identifies with the good objects and it wants to make the bad objects go away. All right. But initially those bad objects are felt as persecuting, that there's something bad. This idea, assuming it's true, helps us explain adult relationships really well. I bet every one of you at some point or another either knows someone or had this experience who got into a relationship and you heard them say, oh, he or she is wonderful, they're Prince Charming, she's perfect, everything is lovely, it's all beautiful, we're going to live happily ever after. And then within a matter of weeks, months, sometimes years, you hear that same person described as a demon from hell. <laughs> now the truth is, they weren't perfect to begin with, and they never became a demon from hell. That is a psychic function of the individual in the relationship not capable of seeing him or herself and the other as a whole object. And feeling, feeling the bad object inside them as persecution. If you, can, if you take nothing else away from this lecture, take away the possibility of thinking about that in your next relationship. Hold to the idea of yourself and the other as whole. Feel that experience of frustration and anger as something welling up in you that must be contained. If you prematurely project it onto the other, you are doing two things. You are unfair to the other person because they're not as bad as you're feeling, and you actually weaken yourself. By projecting out psychically, you are losing something of yourself. The goal of a strong identity is to pull back those projections, to feel all of your feelings, to contain them all. I reject a patient's request to help him make the monsters inside of him go away. There are no monsters. There are only parts of self that are terrifying, persecutory, scary, bad, frustrated, angry, and they are part of who you are and part of a whole that must be integrated and protected. You can't get rid of the dark side. It's actually part of your strength and identity. Much more on this later. The alternative to thinking really thinking, thinking deeply from a place of self-awareness is repetition compulsion. Freud's idea, he called it the repetition compulsion. He initially thought it was almost biologically driven. He saw it as so pervasive. We now don't think of it as biological, except now that we understand the neurological structure of the brain is directly affected and dramatically affected by the relational dynamic between the mother and the child so that in some ways, again, Freud was actually right. It does have a biological component. It's just that that biological com component has a relational underpinning. Or they're so now mixed up, it's hard to tease them apart. Okay. I'm going to move now to some material uh, from Lewis Kaplan's Oneness and Separateness. Uh, she, he also talks about the first three years every human being undergoes a second birth. 
Now, Margaret Mahler described this as the psychological birth of the human infant. And I think that's, that's a concept to keep in mind. We, we are not born fully human. We have that potential. We become human. That a mind is not an endowment we have at birth. It is an achievement that has to be earned through a lot of hard work, effort, uh, and care from the relational dynamic between a mother and a baby. The technical question, assuming that container that allows the baby to take in the, uh, the mother's skills and dynamic and process, how exactly does the baby move from a oneness experience to separateness? Again, it isn't complete oneness even from the beginning. There appear to be relationships that are possible from birth. This is item six or seven on the revolution list. There's very little doubt now that even newborn babies, the day they're born, they seem to have some ability to relate to external objects, to the mother, in a way that seems unique to that person. The assumption now is that babies are object-related from birth. Okay, so that must mean they have some ability to separate, even though most researchers do seem to still think that early in infancy, certainly in the prenatal period, there is, in the prenatal period, a physiological oneness. That seems undisputable. At birth and thereafter, there is now a physical separation, but there still remains a, a psychic reality of oneness, an illusion of integration, an illusion of oneness, symbiosis, symbiotic oneness. And that illusion slowly gets left, gets grown beyond, as the child slowly integrates these pieces, incorporating, interjecting, identifying with the mother's wholeness. And yet, we remain tied psychically to our parents our whole lives. So I'm suggesting that this isn't an external behavioral dynamic. That's the take-home lesson here that we are not talking about a physical separation from parents. I think traditionally it was misunderstood that at some point you grow up and move away. At some point you're no longer, you cut the apron strings, was the old metaphor. That turns out to be inappropriate and inaccurate. There is a balance between oneness, togetherness, and separateness. There's tension between these two poles. It can't be all of one or all of the other. Um, the subject of these lectures is, is not how one or the other happens. We see now that there's a tension between these two poles. And how do we sit in that tension? How do we achieve a good enough, whole, integrated, autonomous sense of identity, which must, by biological reality, remain tied psychically in a relationship or several relationships. Okay, we need both. Kaplan describes a very important social dynamic that I, that I think we have to address a little bit because it's so pervasive that it's very difficult to imagine walking through this discussion of infant development outside the context of the larger cultural changes over the last 30, 40, 50 years. And those cultural changes have been dramatic and in many ways catastrophic, certainly catastrophic to the traditional nuclear family and the focus on maternal baby relationships. Um, The idea is that our culture has come in conflict with what mothers need to be with their babies. Motherhood, says Kaplan, has come into conflict with our post-industrial mentality, a mentality that locates a person's most significant activity outside the home and therefore questions the possibility of a self-realization through motherhood. 
the self-absorbing solitude of mother and infant is interpreted as a lamentable turning away from activity that is considered more socially productive. Legions of women who wish to have children and devote themselves for a time to the care of their children are shamed into believing that such a wish amounts to a capitulation to sexist and antiquated social values extended to exile, intended to exile them to a doll's house. This is a disaster, it appears now. The confidence and pleasure that make it possible for a woman to respond leisurely and sensitively to her baby's need have been jeopardized. It is ironic that the vital importance of a human infant's attachments to its mother should be subverted by shame and impatience at the very moment in history when the complaints of human detachment are loudest. Modern social forces conspire to interrupt the elemental dialogue between mother and infant, the dialogue that ensures our humanity. This is poetry, folks. This is profound wisdom that there is something utterly destructive about a poisonous anti-maternal attitude in our modern culture that somehow denigrates the very idea of a mother profoundly committed to a baby's welfare. Um, an astonishing problematic dynamic. And the derivative of that, and the derivative of that, Kaplan quotes this, those who love themselves just enough will trust themselves to the arms of others without clinging to them in desperation. Now, if you've listened to the lecture on fusion and merger about adult love relationships, this is at the core of that. This idea is at the core of adult love, the ability or the lack to truly love, to be in a love that means love, not clingy emotional need, the only way that is possible, it turns out, is to have that bedrock emotional experience with a committed, healthy, whole, integrated mother's mind. Only then does the child grow up, or perhaps after a great deal of therapy, but the ideal is to have that experience which allows then the growing adolescent or adult a firmness of identity, a, a seeing of the other as whole, which means the, at least the possibility of love. And the ability, I love this, if they love themselves just enough, that is only possible if they've taken in enough love if they've taken in enough of the experience of the deeply devoted loving mother to create that sense of loving ability inside you, they then can take that ability to find love themselves later. If they don't have it from the mother, they cannot give it to someone later. It devolves into the clinging to others in desperation because a baby not loved well enough is in a desperate state absolutely profound. There is some literature recently, and I'm going to stay with Kaplan for just a few more minutes, there is some recent literature that seems to share the responsibility between a baby and a mother. That babies come into the world with certain genetic pre-existing pre conditions, certain propensities. There's been a discussion of of temperament where certain babies are just more fussy than others and certain babies are easy to deal with and that can be quite a problem at times for a mother who herself may be attuned differently and it's almost like they're blaming the babies. Kaplan I think puts this question permanently to rest and some other authors do and I'll come back to it later. Quote, the newborn brings only a physical self, the mother a psychological self. It is not without import that an infant is ushered into the new world, into the arms of a mother who has a psychological past consisting of fantasies, memories, a capacity to tolerate loving and hating, an understanding of the dimensions of the world, of time and space, and a sense of herself as a person with a separate and unique identity. 
From the very beginning moments of her baby's life, a mother's psychological past will enhance her baby's, her infant's slowly evolving sense of psychological selfhood. It seems to me, given that, that the responsibility for meeting the baby's needs cannot be other than solely on the, on the shoulders of the parents. And I want to say parents here. Uh, more on that later. Uh, more on that right now. Speaking of which, let's talk about briefly where are we in fatherhood. This is an area where men and women are not equal. And I'm sorry if that offends, but biologically men and women are not equal. Men cannot go through the dramatic physiological and hormonal and neurological changes a pregnancy means. A woman's mind is transformed by the pregnancy. Not just her body. The mind is transformed. It is in some ways loosened up in the same way her joints are loosened up. There has to be an availability to being stirred up by the baby. If the mother isn't capable of being stirred up by the baby, she cannot contain the baby's experience and therefore cannot provide to the baby the model, the, the material which the baby needs to take in that forms the center of its own mind. Fathers don't have that. And so there's tension. Fathers traditionally want to provide and protect, but they often are distanced from these changes that to them are quite disconcerting quite often. They get ignored. And a father has to understand that primary maternal preoccupation is a real thing. It is hormonal. It is biological. It is neurological. And it will require the mother to focus down on the baby's welfare from late pregnancy to at least the first three months. And the father is going to be ignored to a large degree. And he, knowing that, has to recognize that his role is to contain the containing mother. If he can't do that, the baby, his own baby, is in danger. And so is the mother. The function of a father in the context of a home and family with a pregnant wife is to function primarily as a container of that mother's experience. Without some container, there is no ability on the mother's part to do what has to be done to provide the experience the baby needs. If the father can... Now, there is a parallel between the mother and the father. I think parenting evokes almost equally all of the primitive dynamics in both the mother and the father in ways that are profoundly transformative and terribly, terribly difficult to tolerate. And that has to be the source of a great deal of real thinking, that you've got to be aware that what's being evoked is your own infantile vulnerability, which remains profoundly present in your unconscious, which is part of the very structure of your brain. Both the husband and the wife, the mother and the father, are going to be in a position to be more vulnerable to those primitive dynamics, unfortunately, right at the very time when they can least afford to allow those primitive dynamics to run free. Extra effort has to be imparted to contain their own issues so the father can contain the mother who can then contain the baby. If old anxieties, if old neurosis, old conflicts, old addictions, old angers, rages break out in this context, it can all get very pathogenic very quickly. It is the father's obligation, it is the father's job to provide and protect a nurturing, containing environment. Let's take a short break now, and I'll come back with some neurological and attachment issues concerning prevention. Thank you very much.